Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I really hadn't planned for this. <laughs> Vanetta called me this morning. She said, Mama, I don't feel too good. Say, you think you got something that you can do? I said, I don't know. I'll, I'll pray about it and think about it. So I've been had a little coughing all the week, so y'all pray for me. Amen. By the grace of God, I'm going to try to do this. <clears throat> like a ship that's tossed and driven, battered by an angry sea. When the storms of life are raging and the fairest falls on me, I wonder what I have done that made this race so hard. Then I said to my soul, soul, take care it. The Lord will make a way somehow. I try to do my best in service. Lord, I try to live the best. When I choose to do the right things, evil press on every hand. I looked up and I wondered why that good fortune's passed. Then I said to my soul, soul be patient, the Lord will make a way somehow. I tell you the Lord will make a way somehow. Oh, when beneath the cross. away each sorrows you just let him have your burdens now and when the Lord bowed down so heavy that the weight is shown upon There's a sweet relief in knowing the Lord will make a way somehow. <clears throat> Often there's misunderstanding out of all Well, I go to friends for consolation, and I find them complaining too. So many nights I tossed in pain. Lord, I'm wondering what the day. But I 
the way all of your sorrows you just let him have your burden now and when the load bowed down so heavy the weight is shone upon your brow there's a sweet relief there's a sweet relief there's a sweet relief in no I think I'm about ready to take a vote to keep Marie here. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. She just, she just said, "Now uh, I'm going back to Ohio." You know that, right? <laughs> All right. My sermon title for today is "Where is the power? Where is the power?" Amen. You know, shortly after I began coming back to God, and I was still in law enforcement, somebody gave me a book and I read the book and it was on the Holy Spirit and I became really excited. Prior to that, my relationship with God was not as it should have been and I knew it. And after I read that book, I thought, sure, that I knew why. The absence of the Holy Spirit in my life. From that point forward, I was sure that supernatural power was going to come on me, that I was not going to struggle with the sins that had plagued me before, that everything was going to be different and new. I was so excited that I was on a spiritual high for a time, you might say. That is, until I began to look for evidence, evidence of that new supernatural power in my life. I hadn't seen any tongues of fire. I hadn't heard any mighty rushing wind blowing around me. Even worse, I realized that my temptation hadn't gone any place. It was still there. I began to doubt if I had ever received the Holy Spirit at all. And it wasn't long before I found myself falling into the same old sins. You see, the excitement of new understandings can wear off very quickly if what you think is going to happen does not happen. Are you with me? Yeah. I was left completely disillusioned, especially when I considered verses like Luke eleven thirteen 13 that says God is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask than parents are to give good gifts to their children. Well, I had asked, where's the gift? I began to ask myself if that verse was really true. If it was true, why did so few people around me, why did so few people around me seem to be experiencing that power? Jesus promised that power in the book of Acts to his disciples and hey, I consider myself to be one of his disciples. So I had to ask, where Lord is the power? For some time, I continually wondered if God had really given the Holy Spirit, if he really gives it to people when they ask. I finally concluded that I must be too sinful to receive the Holy Spirit. That must, it must be me. I must have too much sin in my life to actually receive the Holy Spirit. Maybe there's someone here thinking, Mike, you just described my experience. 
Maybe someone else is thinking, I prayed and asked God a couple weeks ago when you told us to do that. But then I went home and yelled at my spouse and my kids and things haven't really changed much at all. Maybe there's someone else thinking, Mike, I prayed to receive the Holy Spirit and I'm still struggling with sin. I'm still wrestling with temptation. Where is the power? Maybe someone else is thinking, Mike, I, I prayed and I got excited too when you talked about it. But you know, I'm still struggling with addiction. Where is the power? Maybe there's someone else saying, hey, I prayed when you said to do it and I still feel separated from God. I still feel lost. It begs the question, how can I know, how can I know that I've received the Holy Spirit? And what should I expect to happen when I say that prayer? Does anybody here relate to that? We need some answers to this question, amen? Because you know, Jesus said, unless one is born of the water and of the, they cannot enter where? The kingdom of God. We need the power. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's go to God's word this morning and see if we can find some answers to these very difficult and perplexing questions as it relates to the Holy Spirit. Before we go any further though, as always, we need to pray for the Holy Spirit so we can understand. Amen? Amen? All right, here we go. Father God, I thank and praise you for your word that leads us into all truth, that answers the difficult questions of life. Lord, we don't understand everything about the Holy Spirit. We readily confess that. Only what your word tells us about the Spirit. But Lord, today I ask and pray that he would be very real in this service, that he would be very real in our lives and in our hearts, and that we would leave here different than the way we came. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Let's go to the time when the Holy Spirit was poured out with power and glory. Because I don't know about you, when I hear the Holy Spirit, I usually think about Pentecost. Amen? Amen. That's usually what I think about is Pentecost. So let's go there and check it out. As always, I'm going to put the verses on the screen. I think you can see that. You can turn your Bible if you, you would choose, prefer to. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all what, church? That was pitiful. Let's try that again. They were all what church? With one accord and in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues of what? Fire, flames. And one set on each of them. If we could only have an experience like that. None of us would need convincing of what the Holy Spirit could do in our life. None of us would need to ask, has the Holy Spirit come into me? Amen? None of us. But you know, I don't think we could handle it. I think we would all scream and run out of here. People would be calling the conference and saying, I don't know what happened in that service, but it was crazy. But you know, as awesome as this passage of Scripture is, it's passages like this in the past... It caused me to feel disillusioned after I'd prayed to receive the Holy Spirit, to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to say for the record this morning that I personally have never had a day of Pentecost experience where I see the power and I hear the power. I've seen God do powerful things in my life. Maybe you have seen and heard powerful things like that. A day of Pentecost moment. But I can't say that I have. Think about it. The sound of a rushing mighty wind. Flames of fire on our heads. I can just imagine that my adrenaline would be flowing. And I would feel a fi mixture of fear and excitement all at the same time. And I would say, bring more on of that. This is awesome be incredible. But you know, as I read the Bible, I see times when the Holy Spirit does miracles. 
in a very visible and audible way. But there's many times when he works very quietly in the hearts of God's people. Are you with me? You see, we can go way too far with our expectations of what should happen when we pray for the Holy Spirit. We can go way too far when things don't go exactly the way we think they should. We can get discouraged like I did. Or we can try to make something happen, make something happen to force the issue, to feel something, if you will. We can go crazy. I thank God we don't do that in this church. Amen. Amen. We can speak in unknown tongues and make a bunch of sounds. We can roll around in the floor. We can create all kinds of energy, if you will, of our own devising. We can do all that. I told you about the time that I went to the non-denominational church. I'll never forget that as long as I lived. To say it was crazy... (laughs) It was an understatement. It was crazy. And that wasn't even a, quote, Pentecostal church. That was a non-denominational church. I had no idea what I was in for. This is a picture I found on the Internet. But you know what? It looked a lot like that. I mean, it was crazy. People were indeed rolling around on the floor. They were screaming out, Jesus! Others were blah, 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 you know, speaking in tongues. Others were being slain in the spirit. They'd fall to the floor and convulse. No joke. They'd lay there and shake. I thought, Lord, help me get out of here. (laughs) But it leads me to ask the question, must I do that to be filled with the Holy Spirit? You know, during that entire service, I never once heard a mighty rushing wind. I never once saw a flame of fire on anybody's head. Britain was there, did you? Nope. No, I saw instead a bunch of well-meaning people, very sincere people, acting like they had lost their minds. Now, I suppose that if I told them that, or if I was to tell one of the people in service that, they would say, well, Mike, that's because you have never received the Holy Spirit. So obviously, it's going to be strange to you. But if you felt the power, you would be down in there on the floor, too. Uh, You're right, I'd have to feel a lot of power to get down on the floor and roll around. Again, I'm sure they were very sincere, and I don't want to be disrespectful to their worship style. But come on, if I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, do I have to have a Pentecost type worship every single time I worship God? No, not at all. You see, what I'm saying here is we've got to be careful. Sometimes the ideas of other churches and other people get us confused. And they begin to influence us as to the Holy Spirit, who he is, what he does, and what should happen when he comes into our life. Are you with me? In other words, be careful of anyone who tries to get you to focus more on feeling than faith. Feeling than faith. Some Christians will tell you that if you don't feel something powerful, You have not received the Holy Spirit. Should I feel something powerful that makes me speak in tongues I don't know what I'm saying? That makes me jump up and down and maybe jump a pew? What if after I pray for the Holy Spirit, I don't feel any power? Does that mean that I didn't receive the Holy Spirit? You see, instead of going crazy, I would much rather receive power from the Holy Spirit that will change my life and make me think and act like Jesus. Amen? Amen. I would much rather experience power that would help me to love Jesus a lot more than the sin that so easily entangles me. 
I would much rather receive power that would cause me to lose interest in the things of the world. I would much rather receive power that would help me to love other people like Jesus loves people. So what should you and I expect to happen when we ask to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Probably not that. Probably not that. Let's look at John chapter 16. We're going to find some answers. Jesus is speaking in these verses. We need to hear it from him ourselves. John chapter 16 verses 7 through 15. Nevertheless. Are you there? Please say amen. If you're turning there, okay. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart... I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will do what, church? He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you. But you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into how much truth? All truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you of things to come. He will glorify me and he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All the things that the father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. First, Jesus makes it clear that the Holy Spirit came to earth to take his place when he ascended to heaven. He said, if the Holy Spirit, if I don't go, the Holy Spirit will not come. But when I go, I'll send him. Just like the Holy Spirit lived with those first disciples, I'm sorry, Jesus lived with those first disciples, the Holy Spirit came to replace Jesus and live with them after he went to heaven. But more than that, the Holy Spirit came to live with you and me as well. All the disciples of Jesus down till the end of time. And when when he came, what did Jesus say that he would do? He would convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now let me say, when verse 8 says the world, my mind tends to think, The world that doesn't know Jesus. But that's not what it means. It's saying the world, both believers and non-believers. Because you see, the same Holy Spirit is working on us right now. And he's also working on a drug dealer right now. A prostitute somewhere right now. Everybody. The Holy Spirit is working. When a person receives the Holy Spirit, one of the first things that the Spirit begins to do is convict that person of sin. Convict that person of sin that is in their life. And he leads them to repentance. He leads them to repent. But what is sin? What is sin? You see, sin is deeper than simply having wrong thoughts or actions. It's much deeper than that. Even though most of us us think of it that way. The primary sin that the Holy Spirit will convict us of is unbelief. Unbelief. It's at the root of all sin. You see, to give in to temptation and sin has a lot more to do with what I believe than it does behavior. Are you with me? Say amen if you... All right. Actually, every temptation to sin, hear this, Every temptation to sin is at its root a temptation to disbelieve the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every temptation. Gerhard Ford said it this way, the sin to be ultimately expelled is our lack of trust, our unbelief. You see, the only reason we take the bait in sin is because we think in our minds that it will satisfy our deeper hunger for meaning, for freedom. For validation, respect, empowerment, 
affection, a sense of greater identity, self-worth, and so on. What I'm saying is this, church. The same that was true for Eve is true for you and I. We believe there's something better than what Jesus has to offer us, or we would not sin. We believe that sin will somehow make us happier, more fulfilled. Our failure to lay aside sin is the direct result of our refusal to believe of what is already ours in Jesus Christ. We refuse to believe that through the Holy Spirit, our connection with Jesus provides us with everything, please say everything, everything everything we need. Everything. Whether that's happiness, fulfillment, the provisions we need, everything we need is in Jesus. Everything. Everything we long for, we already possess in Christ. But you know, sin and Satan come along and say, no, if you would just do this, you could be happier. If you would just taste this, if you would just eat that, if you would just do that, if you would just call so-and-so, you're going to be happier. You're going to be more fulfilled. So when the Holy Spirit convicts a person who smokes to stop smoking, when the Holy Spirit convicts a person who uses curse words to stop cursing, when the Holy Spirit convicts a person who commits adultery to stop committing adultery, he's convicting them to believe that everything they need can be found in Jesus. They don't need that, whatever that is. Now you see, the Holy Spirit is just like God the Father and God the Son. He hates sin. Because he knows that sin brings separation between us and God. And ultimately, sin will destroy us. Amen? Amen. It will destroy us. What's that quote? It says, One sin consistently cherished will neutralize all the power of the gospel. One sin consistently cherished will neutralize all the power of the gospel. That's me in my early days. I look about 16. But it must have been at least 21, because I think you have to be 21 to be a police officer. So I look pretty young. But you know, I'm going to be honest with you this morning. It's time of confession. When I entered law enforcement, I picked up some bad habits. I wasn't walking with God then. One of the bad habits I picked up was cursing. Used a lot of profanity. That's very common in law enforcement. If you've ever hung out with police officers, now when I go back and ride with those guys and they start using them, I'm like, ugh. It, it just, if you haven't been around it in a while, and they're still talking like I used to talk, I do. I cringe. But I didn't cringe back then. When I had a bad day, I would vent. And I would use a lot of expletives to express that. (laughs) Had a bad day, I'd pull up beside one of my buddies and vent and say all kinds of bad words that I should not have said. I did it so much and it became so normal to me that a couple of times when I was dealing with the public, I slipped up and almost used it with the public. And I thought, I'm going to get myself in big trouble if I don't stop this. But you know what? I didn't stop for a while. But when I began to coming back to God, and I asked the Holy Spirit to come into my life, one of the first things, the first things that disappeared from me was profanity. I can't tell you when it stopped, where it stopped, how it stopped, but that was one of the first things that went away. There came a day when I stopped and I said, wait a minute, I haven't used those words in a while. When did that stop? (laughs) But you know as awesome as that was? I did not equate that with an evidence of the Holy Spirit being in my life. Wasn't spectacular enough. Wasn't miraculous enough. Wasn't a flame of fire. Wasn't a mighty rushing wind. I was looking for something spectacular on par with the day of Pentecost, which led me to get disillusioned. You see, I was just a little confused back then. 
But thank God I was still being convicted of sin. Amen? But the Holy Spirit doesn't stop with just convicting us of sin. Stay with me. I want you looking up here. I want you to hear this. This is so important. But the Holy Spirit does not stop with convicting us just of sin. No, when the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life, he also convicts us of righteousness. Righteousness. The Holy Spirit reassures the believer, you see, that not seeing Jesus in the flesh is actually, it's actually a promise. It means that he is in heaven ministering for us in the heavenly sanctuary. He's ministering his shed blood because you know what he's going to do when he's done with that job? He's going to stand up and he's coming back. So it tells me he's not done with his work just yet. But it's even better than that because the Holy Spirit goes to work to convince us that God's grace is based on his character, not my behavior. Let me say that one more time. The Holy Spirit goes to work convincing me, convincing you, that God's grace is based on his character, not your behavior. If somebody doesn't say amen to that, we need to start over. Maybe I need to go back to the beginning of this message. That's incredible news. You see, he turns our focus to the cross. He brings us to the realization that no matter what sin we may have committed, whether it be murder, rape, robbery, whatever you can imagine, the worst sin you can even conjure up in your mind, it was all nailed to the cross for the believer in Christ. Because the Holy Spirit loves us, he reveals all this to us. He cares about us. But he goes further than that. He goes further than that. I want to spend a little extra time on this one because I think this is an area we need help in. Amen. But he also goes further than that because he also goes to work to help us to realize that when we come to Christ and receive him as our Lord and Savior, it's as if we have never sinned before. Amen. That, my friends, is good news. And if we do make a mistake, if we do make a mistake and we fall into sin, the Holy Spirit points us back to the cross. He leads us back to repentance so we can be forgiven and cleansed. When the Spirit comes into a person's life, he wants us to understand that we're under God's saving grace. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. Because he also goes to work to convict us of judgment. Judgment. The Holy Spirit helps the believer to understand that Satan, the arch enemy, has been judged and defeated at the cross. He's been judged and defeated at the cross. That means that you and I no longer need to be under the control of his power. That is, unless we entangle ourselves again in a yoke of bondage, we choose to go back to him. But we don't have to be under his power. Isn't that good news? The next thing we can expect when the Holy Spirit enters into our life is to receive the fruit of the Spirit. We begin to receive the fruit of the Spirit. Look at Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. I want all those things. How about you? This does not mean that we become perfect the moment that we accept the Spirit into our lives. Now listen to me, church. The Holy Spirit can change you or me no faster than we allow Him to change us. Did you hear that? The Holy Spirit can change you or me no faster than we allow Him to change us. No faster than we're willing to surrender our will to Him. He doesn't brainwash us. He impresses us. He draws us.
to choose to follow his lead. And if we do, his power will transform our lives. Finally, the third thing you can expect when the Holy Spirit comes into your life is gifts. Gifts. You see, he does not come into empty handed. He does not come empty handed. No, he brings gifts with him. We talked about 1 Corinthians 12. I'm just going to read a couple of verses of it a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are diversities of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. What he's talking about is gifts. The Holy Spirit brings gifts when he comes into your life. He endows you, he endows me with gifts for the service of God, for lifting up Jesus' name, for spreading the gospel. But if we don't use those gifts, we dishonor the Holy Spirit. We dishonor our fellow man who we're supposed to love because our using that gift may equate to somebody being saved. So, so important. Can you see how awesome and important and necessary and vital the Holy Spirit is? Please say amen if you can. Not to mention the fact without the Holy Spirit we have no real connection with heaven. We have no connection with Jesus without the Holy Spirit. We have no connection with the Father without the Holy Spirit. When you or I ask him into our our lives, he comes in. And begins working on us, even though, even though we may not immediately notice anything miraculous happening. Did you hear that? Even though we may not go crazy. So when can we expect to see supernatural power that we can see and hear? Power that's on par with Pentecost. Is that clock right? I want to make sure I'm not preaching all day long. Okay, we're all right. So when can we expect to see supernatural power? Power that we can see and hear. Power that's on par with Pentecost. On the day Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples. And in John chapter 20, verses 21 and 22, he said this. Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also do what, church? I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive who? The The Holy Spirit. Notice I didn't say receive what? The Holy Spirit's a person. Receive the Holy Spirit. You see, why did he do that? He did it because he was going to send them and he wanted them to be sent in the same power that he was sent in. Can you see that? The same power. He told the disciples to receive the Holy Spirit, but did you realize that Pentecost... He said, receive the Holy Spirit. That day, Pentecost didn't happen for another 50 days. Now, there's no evidence in the scripture that they started speaking in tongues that day. That they did miraculous things that day. No, in fact, they they weren't ready. They weren't ready for Pentecost. They just received the Spirit. During those 50 days, the disciples spent much time in fervent prayer. They spent much time repenting of their sins. And later, when the time when the Holy Spirit knew it was right, Pentecost happened. It took time for them to become of one accord. These are the same guys that were arguing about who the greatest would be. It took time for them to deny self. So the fullness of the Holy Spirit can manifest himself in their lives. But when the time was right, boom, the Holy Spirit came. Supernatural power came. He came in fullness. But again, please do not miss why he came. Let's look at Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power. We looked at this verse last time. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall do what? 
be witnesses to me. A lot of times we stop at the first part. You shall receive power. We all want power. But what do we want power for? Jesus says so you can be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You see, the Holy Spirit did not come so the disciples could know they were filled with the Holy Spirit. He did not come to pump them up or to set them up before the people. He came so 3,000 people could be baptized in one church service. I'm ready for a church service like that. How about you? Peter then stood up, empowered with the Holy Spirit, and preached a powerful sermon. And those 3,000 people's hearts were pierced. They were touched. And they made their decision to go through the waters of baptism. The Holy Spirit, not the disciples though, decided when the time was right for that supernatural manifestation of power to happen. Notice the promise that Jesus made to his disciples in regard to the Holy Spirit in Matthew chapter 10, 19, and 20. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but who, church? The Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Christ promised that when the time came, the disciples would be arrested. And when that happened... The Holy Spirit would show up and do miraculous things. He would speak through them. It would be a powerful manifestation. When the display of power was needed. Finally, God promises a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit and latter rain power just before he returns. I want to be ready for that. How about you? You better receive the early rain. Better receive the early rain. You need to receive the Holy Spirit before that time comes or you're going to miss the latter rain. Revelation 18.1 After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great authority or power and the earth was illuminated with his glory. Supernatural manifestations are going to be seen often during that time. They're going to be seen often because they'll be needed. As God's people are energized and empowered to take the three angels' messages to everybody who will listen. But that manifestation of power that we will see and hear will not come until we are ready and the time is right. Supernatural power is always available to the spirit-filled believer when it's needed. It's always available. The Holy Spirit knows when that power is needed, not you and I necessarily. But don't ever let anyone tell you that if you don't see or hear something, if you don't feel something, that you've missed the boat when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Because he doesn't always work that way. We must make sure that we are operating on faith a lot more than feeling. Because church, who else can provide feeling? Satan can. Satan can. He can make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. He can make you go wild and crazy. And all the while think you're doing it in Jesus' name. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not attacking feeling. Feeling, good feelings are good. And you will have good feelings when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. But please, don't ever let that be a determining factor if you have the Holy Spirit or not. Because if you do, you're on dangerous ground. Dangerous ground. I'll tell you a story and we'll land the plane here. How about that? A missionary was on furlough and speaking at his home church in Michigan when he told this true story while visiting. He said, while serving at a small field hospital in Africa every two weeks, I traveled by bicycle through the jungle to a nearby city for supplies. It was a journey of two days 
and it required camping overnight at the halfway point. On one of these journeys, I arrived in the city where I planned to collect money from a bank, purchase medicine and supplies, and begin my two-day journey back to the hospital. Upon arriving at the city, two men were fighting. One was seriously injured, so I treated his injuries and I told him about Jesus Christ. He said, I then traveled two days, camped overnight, and arrived back home without incident. Two weeks later, I repeated the same journey. When I arrived back at the city, I was approached by the young man I had treated. He told me that he knew I carried money and medicines. He said, some friends and I followed you. We followed you into the jungle, knowing that you would camp overnight. We planned to kill you, to take your money, and to take the drugs that you were carrying. But just as we were about to jump your camp, we saw that you were surrounded by 26 armed guards. At this, the missionary laughed and he said, no, I'm sorry, I was all by myself. I don't know who you saw. But the young man was persistent. No, sir, I was not the only one to see those 26 guards. There were five other people there. They saw them too. They were there. It was because of those 26 armed guards that we were afraid and we left you alone. At this point in his message, a man in the audience jumped to his feet and interrupted the missionary and asked for the exact day the incident happened. The missionary told him and the man excitedly told this story. On the night of your incident in Africa, it was morning here and I was preparing to go play golf. I was about to tee off when I felt the urge, the strongest urge to pray for you. It was so strong and it was so powerful, so overwhelming, that I called some men in the church and asked them to meet me so we could lift you up in prayer. He then said, if you're one of the men here that I called and you came to pray, stand up. The men who met together stood up right there in the service. The missionary wasn't really concerned about who they were, but as he began to count, he began to weep. 26 men stood up. 26 men stood up in that service. The power, the Holy Spirit is available to those who believe, those who are filled with the Holy Spirit. And he will provide the power at the time was right, even when we may not realize he's doing it. He'll provide power for you, he'll provide power for me. Don't wait until you feel something to claim God's promise or to believe that he's answered the promise. Thank him for answering the promise because our God does not lie. If you've got sin in your life, if you're cherishing sin in your heart, let it go. Let it go. Because that can be a barricade for the Holy Spirit. Let that sin go. Ask the Holy Spirit into your life. And then continue praising God that he has kept his promise and let faith confirm to you that God has kept that promise. It won't be long till you begin to see the Holy Spirit changing this in your life and changing that in your life, just like he did with me with using profanity. Just imagine what could happen if that kind of experience happened for all of us here. If we were all filled with the Holy Spirit, imagine if we surrendered all of our pride, all of our plans, our wills to Him. What would happen? Miracles would happen. We would be empowered to do such incredible, mighty things for God. And no, I'm not just talking idealistic. Because that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. The problem is, many times, right here, right here. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Are you praying for Him daily? We're leaky vessels. Ask Him to come in every day. Thank God. Surrender your will to Him and watch Him work. Amen. Amen.
Einstein does it. Just before the praise team sings, I want to let you know real quickly, there will be a, just a brief meeting of the first impressions coordinators immediately after the service, and we're going to have a brief choir rehearsal as well. If you're interested in being in the Easter program, and I hope you are, say yes, please stay after so you can be part of that. Amen. Everybody sing with us, lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up ye pilgrims, be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming. true Jesus is coming again and until he comes we need the Holy Spirit we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit we need to claim the Holy Spirit we need to walk in the ways of Jesus not in the ways of the world let's bow our heads and pray Lord God we thank you so much this morning for giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit what an incredible offer when we consider all that he does in our lives Lord I suppose that we don't even understand all that he does in our lives but he does a lot, dear Lord, and without him, we're hopeless, we're lost. So this morning, Lord, I'm praying for a fresh baptism to fall on this congregation, to fall on those that aren't here today. Lord, that we would see them come back next week. But Lord, I pray we can walk in your ways and not our own. I pray, Lord, that we would begin to see the Spirit taking hold of our lives, and that you would give us the courage, the strength, the power to lay down our plans, our pride, our will, so the Holy Spirit can work in us both the will and to do of his good pleasure. That's our prayer in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah. 